Okay, so say you have a situation where you want to like simulate on a computer where particles will go based on their interactions um, over time. So say you have little particle 1 and it has a starting position x0, it has a starting velocity v0, and you ask the question where is it after 8 hours pass? Well, Newton asked those questions and he said, ultimately, that the velocity at some time t is equal to its initial velocity plus its initial acceleration times the change in time that passes. And similarly, its position at time t is its original position plus its original velocity times the past time plus its original acceleration times one half times the square of the past time. These are known as Newton's equations of kinematics um, and they can answer questions like this. Things get more complicated and past what you learn in general physics in school when there's another particle here and it interacts with this one. Because you can't just ask now what happens after eight hours. You have to ask what happens right after both of them move right here and their interaction is different and then based on that new interaction maybe they move like that and then they actually push each other away as in the case of atoms and molecules. If you want to answer questions like that you have to deal with time integration step by step you discretize this problem and just like any kind of calculus or any problem where you want to solve an integral in calculus. The conventional way to do this, say from time 0 to time t equals t, from t equals 0 to t equals t, you would do integral from time is 0 time to t of a dt. And whatever form a has with t in it, you do that calculus. In terms of physics, a is dv dt, so what you have is this integral, which is just dv integrated from 0 to t. Well, the fundamental theorem of calculus says this integral is v, whatever v is at time t, minus whatever v is at time 0, right? The generic form is just dx from x is a to x is b is just b minus a because x is a and x is b. So here v depends on t and v depends on 0. This is a time integration. So you get a functional difference instead of just a numerical difference. But the, the form is the same, and it's still a fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, these are the kind of problems you can solve by discretizing Newton's equations of motion, where instead of 8 hours as your delta t, you'd have something, in the case of atoms and molecules, as like one femtosecond as delta t. That's 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Super faster than a snap of the fingers. And in the case of gravitational dynamics and modeling planets and galaxies and such, you'd have maybe, uh, I really don't know what they do, but it's probably on the order of years or even thousands of years if the system is ginormous. So the smaller your system, the smaller your time step, because they are moving comparatively very fast. A, a gas in general, the molecules in a gas move roughly 500 meters per second, which is faster than any car you've ever driven. Um, <coughs> so you have to take very small time steps, because if you take too big of a step, then you could be saying, oh, this one went there and this one went there, ignoring everything in between, but that's the important part of the physics. So anyway, velocity verlet is used kind of as a go-to favorite integrator for solving Newton's equations of motions for molecular simulation and gravitational stuff and video games, it's all over the place. I wish that I had something like this derivation when I first started, but that's how you learn. So I'm going to go through kind of a quick version of this. First I'm going to show Euler's equations and then I'll just show how velocity verlet is different. Why it's better. So Newton's equation 
So as F is MA, that's the same thing as F is M dV dt. We can move M over like that. And now we can integrate both sides to find out about the velocity. So on the right hand side here, you get V at time T minus V at time zero is F over M, which can come out of this integral. There's no explicit time dependence for the force. It's different at different times, but only because the positions are in different places. In other words, force is a function of all the positions in general, not the time. Uh, whereas velocity can be written as a function of time. They're all interconnected, but <coughs> the mathematical dependence for time is not explicitly there. It's only, if you like, it's, it's inside the position. But if you isolate an instant in time, time dependence goes away. So the long version of that is just that this integral is f over m times t, because it's integral 1 dt times f over m. So, and you can rewrite this like that. Or in other words, v0 plus a at 0 times t. So don't confuse this as a function of t, it's just times t, really, times t. <coughs> so here's our first equation, which looks familiar over here. The time steps I'm using are instead of like 0 to delta t or t to t plus delta t, I'm just using 0 to t for simplicity in the math. But you can use any endpoints and the equations will take analogous forms like this. I use 0 to t here. Alright, so you can continue this procedure for the, for the position. The x of t dt is velocity. It's dx dt. Integrate that from 0 to t. Same thing on the right side. Integrate from 0 to t. <coughs> Here we get x at time t minus x at time 0. On the right we get v at 0 times t plus 1 half a at 0 t squared. So integral of this, v0 is just a number with respect to time. It's not dependent on what time you're at, it's just the velocity at the beginning. So you get v0, v at 0 times t. Here you get 1 half times a at 0, which is also just a number, times t squared for the integral. I'm assuming some knowledge of calculus. We can finally arrive here for our second kinematic equation. So this one and this one are the same as what I wrote here, which is what high school and early, early college physics students memorize often. Uh, but this is a calculus derivation. This is the thought process that Newton had. So, in practice, um, this is incredibly useful because uh, you can, again, take two particles, calculate their force, and determine for some small time step where they'll be at the next time step. Then at those new positions, you can recalculate the force, find out their new positions. Then at that new time step, you can do it again. But at a certain point for atoms and molecules, you actually change the trajectory because the attractions turn into repulsions and you get motions like bonds. So like a, a, uh, a conventional picture of a hydrogen bond of a H2 bond is that, you know, the particles approach each other, but then they also repel each other. And it, there's some harmonicity or pseudo harmonicity that can describe the bond. Um, so you can use this to model this kind of stuff. Now in practice the kinematic equations of motion which I wrote, I'll just write the one for position here, um, <coughs> can be used just in the form we derived. We did Euler's integration, but velocity verlet says instead of doing our integral with all adding up all these rectangles, like so, like Riemann sum, Euler's integration would give you this kind of approximation to the integral. The integral is, of course, the whole area under the curve. But when you discretize it on a computer, uh, you have some error, right? So the bigger your time step, if I drew an analogous integration with a bigger time step, it would look like this say twice the time step in blue. Here's our new rectangles. 
you can see that the blue has a lot more error a lot of information is lost here than the black so the smaller your time step the better but the trade-off is the smaller your time step the more calculations you have to do there are different ways of doing integrals there's trapezoid rule simpson's rule riemann sum etc but velocity relay takes this problem in the context of physics and says instead of just each raw Euler style time step take the plus or minus one half time step so where this is delta t one here's your second time step two delta t third time step and so on you're taking the half points really that should be here sorry and half 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 and it's a little uh, fine-grained here but what you see is while you still have this error in losing some of the integral you actually gain some counter error when you move the endpoints of the time step to center the uh, actual in increments. <coughs> so here you're just consistently losing, 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 losing information. And, and as time passes, you can imagine like one year into the future, the integral is so wrong because you keep losing uh, quantity. But here, every time you lose some, there's kind of a counterbalance to, to add some. And over here you'd get, you know, that. So adding some, losing some, and after one year, it's a lot better approximation. So the routine you end up with for doing velocity relay is that it looks much more like that, where you're doing half steps. You do half the step uh, and integrate the in-between points. And so you get this plus or minus counter acting error, which in the long term is very stable. There are more sophisticated reasons why velocity relay is fundamentally uh, really the best long-term integrator for molecular dynamics, but uh, I will just touch on that later and not talk about it now. Uh, so the routine is that you can calculate the velocity at the half step, half of what the normal Euler integration would be. I'll write that here. So as opposed to just a naught delta t, we're doing half of that here. Then you can calculate the position at your new step like this. So here you're saying the new position is the old position plus this half step velocity times delta t, which effectively is something of this form times delta t, v naught zero delta t plus a naught zero delta t squared, which is what this looks like. So there's no delta t squared explicitly in velocity relay, it's just hidden in that you proceed by just multiplying by delta t the, the velocity you had before. So then you can get the accelera acceleration, which is a function of all those new coordinates over the mass of the particle. And then you can finally get the full time step velocity by adding the half st time step velocity and a half uh, of your new acceleration. So these are your four steps for doing velocity relay in practice. And what you notice is that every time step, right after you move the positions of the particles, you have to recalculate the forces on all the particles. So what this looks like in a context of code is something like this. So for the velocity relay algorithm, first thing we do is calculate acceleration and velocity, <coughs> which is in the first step. Then we can get the position, like so. We do a periodic boundary check if the system is uh, on a computer when you want to do uh, like an infinite kind of system, then you move particles that escape your box it back into the box. So that's what's that. <coughs> and then you calculate the forces again, that's in step three here. And then you recalculate, you can recalculate the uh, 
acceleration, which is also step three, and velocity. These functions are just called here, but their context is described in another file. This is a code I've been working on since the beginning of grad school, so it's kind of in depth at this point. Uh, but the essence here is that the velocity, you can see, you add to the velocity half of the acceleration times time. That's right here. See that? And <coughs> then to get the new position in the velocity relay, half step, you multiply by, or you add the velocity times dt, which is here. And then you get your new acceleration by the forces, uh, which is not shown here. The forces can be very complex depending on what kind of potential uh, or force field you use to describe the system. Uh, and then you can get the velocity again, which is just the same function here. It's just add, again, whatever that new acceleration is times dt. And a quick kind of pictorial representation or a visualization of that can be shown. So this is molecular dynamics. It's a simulation of the motion of atoms and molecules. And every single frame here is a reiteration of the entire single instance of a velocity relay algorithm. So the atoms and molecules are all wiggling around based on forces that are computed every time things move. And then they're recomputed after they move, you know, and it goes on and on, which is why we have computers do it instead of manually doing it. So if you appreciate this video or it was helpful, please like, comment, and subscribe. I am pretty new at this, so suggestions are most welcome, and have a great day.